All right, so <clears throat> I am a little still getting my bearings, so uh, bear with me, all right? My mind is now racing to all sorts of different places. Um, so this week I will be gone for part of the week at a conference training. And part of this is for, in our Methodist system, pastors who are on their way to what we call full connection. So right now I am provisional is the term. They used to call it probation. Uh, it didn't sound as cool, so they gave it a more inviting name. But whatever you want to call it, this week I have to go to this training. One of the things that we do at this is we wrestle with the ordination questions. So to be ordained in the UMC, you have to write these you know, documents on your theology. And one of the questions that gets asked is the question of, how do you understand the kingdom of God? So I remember sitting in my group of other pastors, and we're having this Zoom conversation, and we're talking about this question. And for many of us, the kingdom of God is, is all over the place. And it's interesting because as we begin to think about the kingdom of God, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. What does that mean? What does it mean to pray that the kingdom of God would come? Well, last night at the pumpkin patch, I was talking out some of the things I was thinking about for this message, and I said, I don't want to preach tomorrow. And my daughter Kayla, 10 years old, was like, I got this. I'm like, so you're going to get up and preach? She's like, I, I can preach. Well, I said, we're, we're talking about the kingdom of God. Come on, 10-year-old, what is the kingdom of God? She's like, I don't know, I'll just read your notes. <laughs> Here they are. So we're talking about it, and one of our sweet, amazing volunteers said, you know, the kingdom of God is something that we long for. And I was like, man, that is so true. It's something that wells up within, within us and we begin to long for it. How many of us this morning are longing for the kingdom of God? How many of us are longing for the presence of Christ to be felt as reality? How many of us are longing that the wickedness and the evil and the darkness that we see prevalent in this world would be put to death and nothing but God's light and glory would reign. How many of us are longing for the kingdom of God? You know, I've been wrestling with that for now a few hours, so I changed a little bit of what I was going to preach on um, and unfortunately threw that at the tech team this morning. So thank you guys, love you guys, sorry that, hey, we've got new scripture. So if you're looking at the bulletin, there will actually be some different scripture that we're going to work our way through. But we're going to have a conversation on the kingdom of God. So where we've been is we're in this teaching series called Kingdom Come as we are looking at the Lord's Prayer. Now remember, we've been saying that this Lord's Prayer was really the disciples' prayer because it was the disciples who came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. Here's a model for prayer. So we started uh, two weeks ago talking about kind of what's the shape of this model, what are some of these words, what does it mean to pray, that pray is this conversation that we have between us and God, we can confess to God, we can talk to God, there's different models for prayer, we didn't get into that because we're using this as our model for prayer. And then last week we began with that first phrase, our community, family, Father, relational, personal, loving, who is in heaven, for it is God who is seated sovereignly upon the throne, hallowed, magnified, lifted high, would be your name so that we might treat you as holy and we must not misrepresent you. Well, this week we continue with this idea of the coming of God's kingdom. So what is 
God. What is the kingdom of God? Most simply, the kingdom of God is about God's kingly rule. It is God who is king. He rules and reigns over all things. There is nothing that is outside of the authority of God. He rules and reigns over everything. So at the heart of the kingdom of God is that it's all about Jesus as Lord. The kingdom of God is all about Jesus as Lord. Hey, let's open our time in prayer and then dive in to the word this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we could gather as your people to open your word and hear from you. So, Father, this morning, speak to us through these words, through the text, through this message. May it bring you glory and honor and praise, and may it shape us in how we pray. God, we give it all to you. It's in your name that we pray. And everybody said... Well, let's remind ourselves this morning of the text that we are working with. If you have one of the Pew Bibles, it is on page 760 and 761. This is the Gospel of Matthew. This is chapter 6. And we're just going to look at verses 9 through 13. And it says this. It says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if we or you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And may God bless the reading of his word. This is the model prayer found in the Gospel of Matthew to which we are studying and unpacking. And we are at that second part of this prayer focusing on the kingdom and the will of God. There are three aspects about the kingdom of God that I want to focus on this morning that I think will help us kind of unpack a understanding of the kingdom of God. And it's important for us to have a good perspective on the kingdom of God because Jesus says that when he shows up, he is bringing with him and ushering in the kingdom of God. So we are citizens today of that kingdom. So we're going to look at three aspects of the kingdom of God. And the first is that it is a kingdom of power. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of power. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 19 through 23 says these words. Let me find that here. They should be up on the screen. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and he gave them as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. You see, Christ sovereignly exercises sustaining governance over the world. There is nothing in this world that is outside the sovereign rule of Christ. Additionally, we see that it is Christ who orders all things in heaven and on earth. Everything is ordered by and sustained by Jesus Christ. Additionally, He is preserving, calling, and offering salvation to His people. You see, we are preserved in Christ, we are called by Christ, we are sustained by Christ, and we are offered salvation in and through Jesus Christ. He is sovereign in His exercise over all. All things are sustained by His power. 
His dominion extends over all creation. It is Jesus who has authority over the world's future destiny. For all things are held together in His hand. Do you guys know the old song, He's got the whole world in His hand. He's got the whole world. We could go on and on, but the reality is, is that the world is held together in the hands of God. He sees us and intimately knows us. In God's power and might, He knows every single detail about you and still chooses to claim you as His own. As Father, God has taken us and He has called us to be His children. So as we reflect on our own lives, we can think back from the, our youngest memories. My youngest memory was that I was somewhere in the ballpark of about three to five years old, And my earliest memory was hearing that my cousin Allie had just been born. And I remember this because I was also standing on top of the sink, reaching into the cupboard above, trying to get my sippy cup. So there my parents found me like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, I need a drink. They're like, well, hey, you have a new baby cousin. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's my earliest memory. It was a good memory to my most recent memories of of just standing here right now. Over those near 40 years of life, there's been good days, there's been mediocre days, there's been bad days and ugly days and everything in between. But here's the beautiful thing. God has seen and known every one of my days. He knew when I would fall short of the glory of God, and He also knew when I would live into who God is calling me to be, and He has chosen Me, just as He has chosen you. He's seen your good days, and He's loved you. He's seen your bad days, and He loves you. There is nothing that you have done, are doing, or could do that could separate you from the love of God. For in power, it is Christ who holds your whole world in His hands. It is Christ who has ordered all things. It is Christ who has guided and protected all all things it is Christ who is gathering us to himself in Christ's death he has confirmed his right to have power authority and rule over all for it is he who has died and has risen and resides the power within himself you see the kingdom of God is a kingdom of power because through the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ Jesus has the power to offer grace and hope and life and forgiveness to you and I. And for some of us this morning, we might struggle with forgiving ourselves, but hear me, church family, in Christ you are forgiven. That there is no sin or sinner who is too far gone from the love of God because in Christ you are forgiven. And this is the good news of the Gospel. That you have entered into a kingdom of power that is sustained by Jesus Christ. Additionally, it is not only a kingdom of power, it is a kingdom of grace. It is a kingdom of grace. As a kingdom of grace, it is Jesus that has sovereignty uh, through it all as He bestows spiritual blessings upon all of us. You and I, we experience this kingdom of grace in two very tangible ways. Through the Word of God, as it is read, as it is preached, as it is proclaimed, God reveals Himself to us and shows up in a very real and tangible way when we open this book and we make this known to our lives. For some, I I, I think, you know, specifically for some of our younger folks, I've had so many conversations over the years of, you know, Pastor, how do I hear from God? How do I hear God talking to me? And my first question is always, are you reading your Bible? Because God shows up and speaks to us through His Word. It is alive, it is living, it is active, and God is present in the text. It is unlike any other book you could ever read. I think of C.S. Lewis who says, the more you read the Bible, the smarter in everything else you will become. It is the only book that will make you smarter in other subjects the more that you dive into it because God is present in it. God bestows spiritual blessings to us as it reveals to us the Gospel of Christ. Additionally, we experience these spiritual blessings through the sacraments of baptism and communion. 
Through baptism, we are reminded that we are washed clean of sin and brought into family. And through communion, we are reminded of the sacrifice of Christ's life as His body was broken and His blood was shed in order that we might be forgiven. We are met with these spiritual blessings in this kingdom of grace. In the kingdom of grace, Jesus awakens, calls, empowers, and preserves the church. In the kingdom of grace, the church of Jesus Christ is so important. This is not just a place that you gather on Sunday mornings for 60 minutes to get a quick little power fill up and get back out into the world to take it on. But the kingdom of grace through the church of Jesus Christ becomes one of the most important moments of our day, of our week, of our life. Because we gather with family. The people next to you should not be strangers. We should turn and look to the neighbor to the left. Like, look to your left and wave. Say, hi, neighbor. Turn to your right. Say, hi, neighbor. Behind you, in front of you, we are family. This is a place that we are brought together and it is awakened by, called by, empowered by, and preserved by Jesus. The residents, you and I, of the kingdom of grace are those who have placed their hope, their faith, and their life in Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Rome that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved for all who call on the name of Jesus will find salvation. Church, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Have you believed in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead? Is that the foundation of your hope? Because if so, then you will be saved and ushered into this kingdom of grace. This kingdom of grace is which, um, this kingdom of grace is expressed through which we call this church. For it is where Christ enables us, and Christ equips us, and Christ um, defines and defends us. The kingdom is present within the inner life of us as believers, for it is marked by the Spirit. It's not a physical or economic sphere subject to empirical identification or material measurement. Paul tells us in Romans 14 these words. I think I have this right here. He says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, the kingdom of grace is ruled by the Spirit under a new covenant. We see in Jeremiah 31, 33 that God reminds us that He is giving us this new covenant. It says, for this is the covenant, the promise, the unbreakable promise that God will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, says the Lord, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. God reminds us of this covenant that if we are His people, He's writing His law upon our hearts. That He is claiming us as His own. That He is loving us unconditionally. You see, the kingdom of grace is governed by the preaching of the Gospel. The teaching of God's truth to the church. The continued restraint of sin by the law of God prevalent in our life. It's the providing of what is necessary for salvation. It's the pardoning through repentance. It's the justifying through grace. It's converting through repentance and faith. And it's sanctifying through the Spirit of God. These are the marks of the kingdom of grace. Finally, When we think of the kingdom of God, it is also a kingdom of glory. The kingdom of glory is the future fulfillment of the messianic mission through which all wrongs in history are made right. We call this the idea of Christus Victor. That when Jesus dies on the cross, He dies not only to pardon our sin, but to right every wrong. That the very fabric of the world is being made right through the sacrifice of Jesus. This is the kingdom of glory. In John 17, 24, we're told, Father, 
This is the prayer of Jesus. I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you've loved me even before the foundations of the world. The kingdom of glory is portrayed as a blessed governance by the exalted Savior for the, for, for the faithful in eternity. At the completion of history, there will be a destruction of all obstacles to the reign of grace and righteousness and truth. The church has been made holy, cleansed, and ordered that it might be presented to Christ as a radiant, beautiful bride without stain or wrinkle or blemish. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 29, we're told that as husbands are to love their wives, they're to do so as Christ, hear this, Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for the church, that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such things, that the church might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, for it is Christ who lo- or for it is he who loves his wife who loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. We hear these words of how Jesus treats the church, his beloved. And if you and I are a part of the church universal, then Christ loves us. He's willing to lay down his own life in order that we might have life. He's willing to lay down his life so that we might be seen as spotless, without blemish, perfect in the eyes of God. Within the history of Christ's kingdom, we find that it is He who sustains us by His divine providence. It is Christ who is present as Lord in this kingdom of glory, calling us unto Himself. This is the idea of the kingdom of God. It is a big idea, and we're trying to boil it down just into a few ideas. A kingdom of power, a kingdom of grace, a kingdom of glory. So church family, when we pray that the kingdom of God would come, we're praying for the power, for the grace, and for the glory of God. But not only that, we are praying that the will of God might happen as well. What does it mean to pray for the will of God? Well, the will of God is defined as the power of God to determine God's own intentions to execute God's actions, and to use means adequate to the ends that God intends. God's will is the effective energy inherent in God by which God is able to do all things consistent with His nature. The will of God is eternally directed towards good according to the Scriptures. The will of God is intrinsically connected with the relative divine attributes of omniscience and omnipresence. God knows all things, God sees all things, and God is all-powerful over all things. When I think of the will of God, I think of a river. Anybody ever been down to a river? You ever been a little kid and sneak out and go down to the creek and watch the water flow? It's beautiful, but it's also amazing. You see, the water is always flowing in one particular direction. And the thing about it is is that for you and I, we can enter into the river at any point. We can hop in and stand in the river, and if we're smart, we will flow with it. Because it's a lot easier to flow with the water, right, than it is to try to fight against it. Listen, we're Floridians. We live by the beach. You ever try to swim against the tide? It doesn't go well. But if you flow with the tide, you travel easy. You could look up and be halfway down the beach and not even realize it. But when you step into that river, it's like the will of God. It's flowing in a particular direction towards the good and the glory of God. We can all enter it at different points. We can all step into that river at different points and travel with God where God is going. 
For some of us, though, we try to swim upstream and fight against the will of God. And when we do so, we, we tend to get met with some resistance. That's not to say that we can't, but it doesn't always go so well. We can fight against God's will, but God's will is always moving in a particular direction. See, you and I, our, our calling when it comes to praying into the will of God is to recognize where God's will is already at, at work and to hop into that river and to flow in the direction that God is going. See, when we do that, we begin to see that it is God who rules and reigns over all things. We see that God is still in command and it is still God who is willing all things for the good of those who He loves. You see, to pray into the will of God is to recognize the river and to flow with God. I'm going to invite our team back up this morning, our worship team back up this morning, and as they do, I want to close with just two final thoughts for us this morning, church. To learn about the kingdom of God and the will of God is just the beginning because we're called in the Lord's Prayer to pray for their coming. So what does it mean for you and I when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done? Well, to pray your kingdom come is therefore simultaneously to ask that God's saving royal rule be extended now as people bow in submission to Him and have already tasted of the blessing of salvation as much as it is to cry for the end of things in the kingdom to come. You see, when Jesus teaches us to pray that God's kingdom would come, it is a prayer that the rule of God would be fully known and established in the church, in our lives, and throughout the world. When we pray that God's kingdom would come, it's for us to recognize God's rule and reign in our lives, that He's sovereign over our lives. In this church, that God is sovereign over this church and every church that bears His name, and that God is in charge of all things and all people at all times and in all places. To pray that the will of God would be done is to pray that we would live in perfect obedience to God, seeking to obey God's leading, calling, and commandments in order that our lives and those around us would be fully impacted by God's great grace. When Jesus teaches us to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are to long for the day when the reality of God's rule and reign that is already present in heaven would find its way to earth. How amazing would it be if we were to walk outside these doors and encounter the kingdom of God and that the will of God would be... There'd be a whole lot less hurt, habits and hang-ups going on in this world. And there would be a whole lot more help, hope, and healing that would be going forward. So when we pray for the kingdom of God, when we pray for the will of God, we're praying for the way things ought to be. So church, let us go to God at this time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is our prayer this morning that when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. It is our prayer that our hearts would be open to receive Your kingdom. That our minds would be open to acknowledging Your presence. And that our lives would be open to receiving the power of Christ's life-giving work being present in our very lives. So Lord, bless us to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive what it means to pray your kingdom come and your will be done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.